Right. We are doing the wonderful subject of kilns. Now, one thing I'm going to really stress today is that the topic doesn't include looking at the ins and outs of pottery. Um, it really looks at um, you know why kilns are used and how they're used, and we're mainly come in. No, I'm an archaeologist. Oh, that's cool. Did you know? I don't know. A cleaner? Yeah. I no, no. 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 Anyway, cheers, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Did that just happen? Yeah. Oh, 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 so we're going to be looking at. Is that Sunday knocking again? Hello? Right. No, no, no. But, back to this wonderful archaeology coming at you. Anyway, so we're going to be looking at kilns. And without repeating what I've already said, remembering what I've already said, kilns themselves are a concept when we look at pottery. A concept that can go back maybe as far back as 30,000 years ago. Now, we know that a form of pottery that was used to create figures, those wonderful Venus figures that we've given lectures on before, those figures were heated at such a high temperature that they've lasted nearly 30,000 years. And those Venus figures are figures of uh, women, sometimes pregnant, sometime in other states, um, were produced for purposes that we don't really know about. But they were produced, some of them, in fired pottery. Now, fired pottery itself has to be um, classed as clay that's been fired well over 300 degrees C. And when you fire something well over 300 degrees C, more like 600, more like 800 degrees C, the object itself can last a very, very long time, as demonstrated by these early forms of ceramic wares, i.e. in the forms of these Venus figures, created so many years ago. Now, we need to ask why pottery wasn't produced and fired in kilns 30,000 years ago? And the answer is really very, very simple. If, you're, if you've got a nomadic life, and you've got a, a jar that would store liquid, it's not going to be last very long. It's going to break. It's all about necessity and need. The reason why we didn't produce mugs and cups and storage containers 30,000 years ago was it wasn't practical to produce them. It wasn't because we didn't have the skills to produce pottery, because I've demonstrated that we did. It wasn't until, say, about 8,000, at most 10,000 years ago, that we started to think about using pottery to store things. Whether it was to store liquid, or whether it was to store grain, or whether it was to store something else, we didn't have the need to store materials like that. Because even if we had, the containers that they would have been stored in would have quickly become broken. So when you've got pottery, it's a sign that you're actually established in one area and you're going to be there for longer than a day. Because life 30,000 years ago was a very hard life. Life 20,000 years ago was a hard life. Life is hard today but not as it was hard back then. Today, we might moan and groan about taxes, we might moan and groan about floods and the, and the weather and not having money, but at least we've got houses to live in. And at least we've got a home that we can call our home and we can stay there for a long period of time in some cases. And that's what pottery is all about. We mainly look at the Romans today and the first thing you see in front of you is an updraft kiln. Now we're not going to do smelting kilns today, 
We're not going to do lime kilns today. We're going to do pottery kilns, ceramic kilns, kilns to produce plates and beakers and vases and amphora and so on. What we can see in front of us um, is an updraft kiln, an updraft kiln that is actually above the surface. And when I say above the surface, there's no hole being dug in the ground. It's a very crude updraft kiln. And updraft kilns we know, of, know existed as far back as 8,000 years ago. And we've got evidence for them existing as far back as six and a half, seven thousand 7,000 years ago. For example, on the Isles of Orkney, we've got evidence for them. And we know that they were just placed on the ground and pottery was produced. This itself is probably a little bit more advanced than that crudility that I've just mentioned. But it's still on the surface. You may have a clay lined surface. And all of this is clay lined. And you've got a little flue and a little stoke hole. This is as simple as it gets. As we move on, there's something intriguing about this. A potter's skill is not in the production of the pottery itself, is not in the ornateness of the vessel that they produce. It's the skill that they required to get the temperatures up that they needed in the kiln. For example, I am no potter at all, but I know a little bit about kilns and pottery. But one thing I don't know is, by looking at that, what temperature that kiln is. And a potter looking into that kiln would be able to tell you within one or two degrees what temperature that was. And that takes a number of years of skill and know-how and watching to be able to get to that level of knowing what temperature. Now, if you're producing porcelain plates, cups, you need to know the temperature within a few degrees. Now the Chinese knew this skill. They had known it for around 200 years AD. Give or take a few years, nearly 2,000 years ago. We were not able to learn those skills in Britain until around 300, year, 300 years ago, if not 250 years ago. We were, we were not able to adapt those skills. We were, not, we were not that skilled. You can't learn pottery making and firing within a moment. And I'm going to give you one interesting fact. I, I was, I, 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 and actually I give this lecture three times each week and by the time I get on a, to a Thursday afternoon I'm either absolutely knackered or I know everything and I've been able to present it, which is where I am today. Um, I'll tell you a little, little thing that I was told in the week, was that in the, I think it was 1911 census, just before the war, they looked through the lists and lists of people that were recorded at certain houses, and they couldn't find a single one of the women that would mark down that they were a potter. They couldn't find a single woman that would say they were a smithy or worked in any kind of furnace. Three years later, the men that were marked on those censuses went off to war. Lots of them died. But whilst they went off to war, the women they were able to produce pots equally as good as their husbands. They were able to be the greatest blacksmiths equally as good as their husbands, but none of them had been marked on the census as a smithier. None of them had been marked on the census as a potter. That's strange, isn't it? Because the skills to be able to do any of this took decades. Decades. And they were, there was no way they were able to learn those skills within a few months. Really? Nobody knew the First World War was going to happen. Yeah. Oh, way, way back. And that's the point I'm trying to make. It's the colour, it's the colour, it's the colour, it's the colour, it's the feel of the heat, it's what material you're putting in it. It's taking a long time to build up. 
That you skill. No, you, you just it, you couldn't just sit there in a week and say, right, that that's that colour and become a potter. There's there's other skills as, as well involved that you need water, you need lots of wood. And this this is a very good indication of that, okay? Now that's um that you've got basically two parts to this kiln, okay? You've got the flu, um, and you've got the stoke hole. Now, looking at a different angle, the stoke hole. This is a stoke hole from a slightly different angle, and this is this is in the day that they were trying to build up what materials they needed in the kiln. Now, this is going to sound really really blasé but it's so important not only do you need to know the temperature uh, as the kiln um, is in full operation okay you need to have different grades of material okay so you might need the driest of driest wood what's going on there the drying out the wood but you might need green wood freshly felled you might need charcoal you might need materials that are very unlike the materials that would burn in a usual furnace to us. Basically, they needed to know at an instant to be able to drive the, up the temperature a little bit quicker. They needed to bring the temperature down. They needed to make sure that the flame in front of you is the temperature that remains that, temp that level. Okay? And whether you use green wood or dry wood, or something very, very dry like charcoal, you need to be able to make that choice. You need to have all those grades. You can't just have dry wood and just chuck it in and hope for the best, right? That's going to burn 1,010 degrees. You need to be able to make sure that you keep that consistency, and that's very important to a kiln. The other important thing as well is, is can you imagine, let's look at the average day of a potter. And there's something really wrong about that image, which we'll talk about in a while, right? They're all inverted. If you have a pot standing like that, it all goes plump. So whoever was drawing this had no idea of what a pottery is about. Okay? And probably drawn by an archaeologist. Um, because we're good at excavating things, but not sometimes interpreting things. Um, I'll, give, I'll give you a little bit of a clue, okay? Basically, pottery manufacture is, is a dedicated scientific skill. It's very scientific. It may look like a arts and crafts, but it's not. I, I knew I knew somebody who worked in the um, university in Cardiff once. He was absolutely obsessed by temperatures and kilns. He was absolutely obsessed by it. He lived and breathed it. Really difficult to talk to, but he was a nice enough chap. Um, and I, I learned lots of what I know now from him um, by, by listening and observing and sort of... Um, just, just trying to interpret what he's trying to say. And one, one, one thing I learned was that firing pottery is a long process. You can't just um, do what we do with an oven today and put a, uh, put a pizza in and go back 10 minutes later. Um, we, we have the pizza in 180 degrees C uh, in a fan uh, oven and then we go back tw uh, 12 minutes later and it's done. It, you know it never usually happens like that, does it? But um, so say you take it out from frozen, you need it 14 minutes and whatever. It, pottery's not like that at all. You've got, to, you've got to watch it. Not for an hour, not for two hours, for 24 hours, sometimes for 48 hours. Every, every time you open, every time you um, take away the door, you're looking in and you're having to close it again. You can't just stare at it because if you stare at it, the temperature completely changes. You've got to be able to look and make the decision, right, it's that temperature, let's, let's either take, take, put some slightly damper material in or really dry material in. Let's make that choice. And it's continuous for 48 hours. But there's something else in that, right? If you're a potter, you cannot, for example, um, produce... Say, for example, there's 100 pots in there, right? This updraft kiln, there's 100 pots in there, right? You as a potter, all your pots need to be the same um, consistent structure. That's a good one, consistent structure. What, what we mean by that is it cannot, it needs to be green, the same green, okay? It needs to be going off the same time. So the way to explain this, if you've got, um, if you've got 10 loads, right, you need to work out 
at which point each of those ten lows go off. That one's going to start to go green now, that one's going to start to go green now, that one's going to start to go green. These are all on the same track. So that means that as a potter, you need helpers. You need all those helpers to produce all the pots at around the same time for them all to be then placed into the kiln. Okay? And then you've got to be able to stack them properly in the kiln. Let's do the silly way of stacking in a kiln, okay? Let's just stack them, stack them in the kiln nicely, okay? There's one, there's another, I'm deliberately missing something else. There's another, there's another. Let's stack more, let's stack more, let's stack more, let's stack more, okay? Right, 24 hours later, you've done the temperature thing right, and you've looked inside the kiln, and every single one of those pots are basically glued together. Because there are no spaces, there are no separators. Okay, each 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 pot itself. Okay, each pot itself. There's one pot. There's another pot inverted upside down. Okay, you need th these have gone green. Okay, you, you've made them on the wheel or on a mould. Okay, and basically you get a blob of wet clay and you put it one, two, three. So whenever I can't I can't do this because it's mainly on the bottoms of um, pots you find um, three mats. One, two, three. That's a spacer. Where, where, where basically um, it's been stacked, so there's spaces, spaces, spaces to separate in the kiln. Okay, continue. If you if you if you um, put something in a kiln that way and you stack it, okay, the the, the the it would basically fold in. It would all they would all crush each other. So this is why you've got to turn them upside down, because then the strength is in the way they're placed upside down with all these individual spaces. Now there's a there's a wonderful. Um, there's, there's many wonderful episodes of Time Team. I can't, there's probably about 10 episodes of Time Team that are crap. Right? All, other, all, all uh, uh, the 190 are brilliant. right? And on one or two episodes of Time Team, they actually excavated kilns. Uh, they, actually, they actually excavated kilns, and there was this one kiln they excavated. right? And it was very similar to um, the image of... It was actually very similar to... Very similar to this, right? But on top of it was something like that. There was, a, there was like a holy surface on it, right? Like a plate across the whole thing. And it was a beautiful thing. I've got images of it. It had all these little holes, these little, uh, these little holes in it, which all have to be the same size. So you need the same temperature coming from underneath to heat everything and, and circulate and all the rest of it. And then what they found directly on that, they found loads of tiles, beautiful tiles. But there was one problem with these tiles. There was no spaces in between them. And they had been glazed. Beautiful medieval designs, but they'd all fused together. A potter had had a bad day. He decided, get it in there, right? Forget, he obviously got something to stack it. And it all fused. And the kiln could not be used again. It was completely screwed up. And obviously, you can imagine the archaeologists in time team, they've got these perfect tiles, but they cannot separate them because they've all fused together. And, and that is very important to be able to separate the tiles and the pots when you take them out of the kiln. And that's, that, that's a good demo thing that they actually showed in Time Team once. Back to, now this, this one in front of you is actually from Newport, but we'll look at that in a minute. And it's not medieval, it's Roman. Um, so what, what we've got, um, here's, here's a question and answer. Um, why would you put um, um, a pottery kiln or any kiln outside the city, uh, Dorothy? Why would you put it outside the city? Why would you put it as far away from town as possible? Think that's it. That's it. Temperatures in a kiln can get so hot, can get so hot um, that any timber nearby can go, just go into flames. Okay. The other reason is the smell, the fumes. You need to keep it away from a, a, a town, city, village. There is also something else as well. You also put the kiln where there's a decent supply of clay. Um, and that's very, very important. You always put it where there's a decent supply of clay. Now, um, I don't know if any of you have actually been to uh, Ueni um, and seen the potteries there. You've got clay pits, you've got Ueni pottery, but actually, um, back, in about the, back in about the 1800s, there, there, there was a large number of pot potters there, um, up to about um, six uh, potteries there. Um, producing all things from plates um, to curio things like the, like the Y sale jugs, 
for celebration. Very weird shaped um, jugs with dope little holes and stuff in it. Or they actually had um, a clay pipe manufacturer at um, UNE as well for a very short period of time. And the reason why it was a very short period of time at UNE is because they had to bring the pipe clay in from somewhere else. And they said, right, this is really too expensive. We can't be bothered. Let's carry it on with what we're doing with our normal pottery. And the reason why you any pot potteries are there is because they had a bank of the very best clay that they could actually use. But any of you know anything about you any potteries, you will know today that they, that they ceased using their own clay from a local source quite some years ago. So they bring in their clay from somewhere else to be thrown on the wheel and fire, which is unfortunate. Um, up until very used to, you, you, very, up until very recently, they would use their own um, manganese to give um, um, to to give the colour black on it, um, and then they would also use um, locally mined um, um, iron oxide. They would also use locally mined galena lead. Um, lead stopped being used as a coating on pottery at the UNE potteries for obvious reasons quite some years ago as well. But I know all that material is having to be brought in, which is which is unfortunate. But it's a tourist thing now. It's not it's not mass producing for the huge market. Okay, you go there and a jug's going to cost you 20, 30 quid. Okay, um, but if it had its own clay, it would be able to uh, produce many more um, items of pottery for us all to purchase. And I know you've got a little bit of a, a pottery collection, don't you? Is it? Are you collecting you any pottery, Dorothy? Or is it something else? Oh, cool. Got one from is, are these those money boxes? Are, are, these, are these the ones that you've actually got to break? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's your iron glaze. Yeah, that's your iron glaze. Are those the ones you've got to break to get the money out of? You know that's well, cheating. Well, 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 uh, you know that's cheating. You should break it. Well, so, but back back to these. Um, obviously, what's wrong with this one here? What 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 you have? You have a kiln. You have a you have a central plinth. Okay, that supports a platform, and the air can circulate all the way around it. That's what that's showing. That's what that's showing. That's what that's showing as well. Um, but when, when you look at something like this, um, there, there are, this, this, is, this is one that's been cut into the earth, um, or cut into the stone down below, basically lined with clay. Uh, I'll have to put that in there, rather than on the surface. And the, the, the thing is about that, is when you, um, when you have an updraft kiln, as I've described, the cold air is sucked into the earth. Like it's going down into devil's cold because you you because you gotta instead of going um, horizontally and just going like that any old day you know let's have the heat going through it's gonna take time it's not gonna get the high temperature here uh, you've got the stokers a stokers kit the stokers hole or fire pot and then basically uh, you're firing it um, you're charging up the fire you're burning um, and you're gradually stoking it as well and adding more and more and what this fire needs is air. Basically, the hot air is just sucking vacuums of cold air into it, and as it's going through in speed, it's giving you a higher temperature. That's very important. How uh, often is that? Uh, that? That is actually an updraft kiln as well, but it's under the surface. Oh, yeah, you know, I've, I've just shown you updraft kilns because they're the easiest one. But there is one that isn't an updraft kiln. Okay? Didn't Peter go in one of them and he went to. Um, Carrie Cannon Castle. Yeah. He got very excited with it, didn't he? Yeah. Well, here we go. I were actually lime kilns, lovely, but oh, <laughs> but we are doing kilns. It is a kiln, so it's fine. Um, <coughs> just think of this. Just think of another concept as well. You you get so you get red pottery, um, uh, yellow pottery, uh, buff pottery, uh, earthenware pottery. Uh, when it's being produced in an updraft kiln like this. 
where there's a flow of air. Basically, the ion oxides, uh, the, ion, the ion oxides are brought to the surface. The colour itself is pronounced by the ability of oxygen to flow through the kiln. Okay, oxygen uh, reacting with the ion oxides give them a red colour. Okay, when the when the oxygen when there's a little flow of oxygen, there's not much of it, then the ion oxides act a different way. Again, this is all about science. Um, and the way you do that is this. As you, um, as you build the kiln and you want black or grey pottery, you simply stack it up properly, okay, inverted bowls and dishes all the way upside down, that's how you do it, that's how I've ever seen it, with loads of spaces in between them, I work in a pottery in Barry, remember, um, with our Fuji Company Studio, um, and then what you do, you seal the top. You seal it off. Okay, you seal the top. Um, and what you do, you light the fire below. So you've got charcoal in there, low burning material. And that low burning material is lit and it's allowed to smolder and burns over a long period of time. And what you also do, you also reduce the flow of air in there as well. Because if you've got too much air in there, it'll flow it all out because this is sealed up. And gradually as it would smolder and heat gradually, as you would try to um, heat a, a chicken in the oven um, at a mean temperature throughout so it cooks all the way through, okay, that's exactly what we're doing with the kettle. It burns over a very slow period of time. But if you wanted pottery and roof tile and brick, there and then, um, you're not going to have pottery in a reduced kiln, i.e. with a cap on it. You're going to have it in an oxidised kiln. So this is why most pottery in Roman Britain um, can be seen on most archaeological sites as earthenware, red or yellow. The majority of material on Roman sites is, is a reddy, orangey colour, roof tiles and brick. You do get lots of black burnished ware and lots of grey ware, but not as much usually. Um, black, black burnished ware um, and grey wares are not terracotta at all. The, the normal stuff is terracotta. The, you know, the terracotta tile tiles, uh, obviously um, you've got the, the normal uh, ready colour dishes and bowls which we'll come on to, which I'll show you a quick thing of now. Those are all terracotta. And can you see this is a reconstruction of a kiln? Uh, that, that's, been, that's been placed sort of side up so people, that's inverted, that's inverted, that's inverted, that's inverted. Um, and when you put pots upright, or when you put them side on, that one's got a big crack through it, and that one's been completely broken. So you've always got to put them inverted, because that's where all the strength is, when you've got them inverted. That's terracotta, Dorothy, but we'll go back to where we were. And I'm going to show you something fascinating. Now, until I was doing the research for this, I, didn't, I had no idea that this existed. This is a Roman pottery kiln at the Celtic Manor site. And this was excavated uh, within the past decade, I do believe. No, but there, there, there's, there's all these pottery kilns. There's a, there's a pottery kiln there. And basically, as archaeologists were coming across this pottery kiln at Celtic Manor, what the, while they were scraping the surface, what they come across was this pottery kiln. Um, and they found out that um, it was a pottery kiln because there was this light, nice little circular area. And that there is the plate, and directly underneath that is the furnace. I'll show you the furnace now. That's the furnace underneath. So that underneath supports this. And that's where all the pots would have been placed. Um, now that's, the, that's the basically, um, that would have been the Roman ground level there. But directly above that, all the soils and everything would have been built up. Now where's the, where's the sort of hood, the kiln from on top of it? Where is that area there? The temporary dome. Well, it's quite simple. Um, when you're producing Roman pottery, you've got to break into it to actually get the pottery out in the first place. 
So that's all going to be removed. And the very intriguing thing is, is it, this is all relatively intact. Another thing I would say as well is that when we, when are we, when we work as archaeologists, we do cross sections and profiles of everything. So what's happened is that the archaeologists have cut down there to see what's on either side of the stone coal. So what the Romans have done, they've, they've, they've cut into the rock and they've decided to line it with something else and then they've decided to put these bricks here, reuse bricks, um, and then you've got the stone coal and this is where all the burnt material would be placed and then this would heat whatever was above through this plate. There must be some sort of floor there. That is the floor there. And there must be trays on it. Metal um, there, there, there are different ways of looking at that, Bill, and we're going to do that now. We're, we're going to do that. There's, there's technicality. Let's just go, go back to this. So what we got? We got we've got these pots being stacked up, okay? And these holes have got to be all the same size because they've got to have the same heat going through them to circulate through the kiln. That's very, very important. And directly below that, what we do find um, is actually the furnace itself. Um, now, I was reading an article, and I'm not really sure this article is right, but maybe I do believe it. In one of the articles, they actually said, listen to this now, that across here, there was actually wooden beams, like spokes in a wheel. Right? And with a furnace underneath, the first thing that would happen would be those wooden beams would set a light. Except at that point... That there would be perfectly fired and, and would be strong enough to hold the pottery on top of it. I'm also told from another article that these would have actually been iron spokes, which would actually make more sense. Yeah. In another description, yeah, that would, but the iron spokes again would heat to a very high temperature, which might cause cracking to the platform above. But what we do find, actually, is that in most circumstances, there were actually pottery spokes leading off it that would take the uh, weight um, of the platform above, and then that would be stacked with pottery. There's different ways of looking at it. The iron would be a good example, but the pottery more so. Um, and that, that's where you would need, you'd have all, need to have all that in, in action and circulation. And Bill, what was that question you asked? There have to be some sort of support mechanism going up to the kiln to support the different layers of what they need to wear. Oh, we're going to do that now. This is not a good example, okay, of, of how I'm going to explain and answer that question. Um, I'm trying to find... Uh, mm, Right, what we've got is this. This may be explaining it, but it doesn't explain it all because the archaeologists got this reconstruction wrong as well. Um, there you go. In a way, what we've got, we've got kilns. Uh, the, as the archaeologists have reconstructed this, they haven't put any spaces in there. Okay, the person who reconstructed this was not, they had nothing, had no idea how kilns worked, okay, which is a shame. Because between those tiles, there'd be little spaces. Between those pots, there'd be little spaces. And the other thing as well is it'd all be inverted as well. That, that's, that's fact. And the other thing as well is if you've got a pot that way up, right, um, and here's a clue to how you pack the kiln. If there's any material in there, right, any bits of wood that are falling into the pot, they will continually burn. And it would have an adverse effect on the pot. So this is why you've got to have them inverted. Now... Bill, you, you've asked, would there, would there be shelves and stuff in a modern day kiln? There would be. You do have shelves and stuff in a modern day kiln. The faces themselves act as miniature sort of um, stacking mechanisms for the pots above. And the main thing is to get as much as you can in the kiln, but you still need to have some circulation, which, which goes without saying. Um, and the way you get around stacking, right, the way you get around trying to keep some stability is is by something that I've very much learnt over the past few years, right? How many of you have ever have been in the garden and thought, right, I need to burn a load of magazines and newspapers? And you just set light to them, 
And for some reason, the, it seems to be the same height and level as when you started. Because when you, say for example, like, say for example, I, I had 20 books, right? And I fold them in the middle of the room and I set lights on them, right? They keep like, like actually going through all the pages, but that as a book would still be there. Like it would still be structurally stable. Even if you start to kick it, it will go into bits, okay? Uh, it's the same as how a kiln worked. What they would do, they would not only pack it with as many items as possible that you needed circulation, you would pack it with a material that could allow circulation, like straw and hay and grass. Okay? And that straw and hay and grass would, would be so tightly placed around the pots that um, it would structurally remain stable. A carbon would keep everything hold, holding up. Except when you remove the pot, it all goes into dust. That's how you do it. And the potter would have known that. He would be very, very skilled. Um, and I've got, to, I've got to be honest with you. The person who reconstructed that, there's hardly any circulation in there at all. So basically it would mean that the items at the top wouldn't be faked or fired, but the items at the bottom would be. Are they just standing on top of each other? Yeah, they know. Oh, yeah. They would. So the, 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 this is the, this is the problem. Um, I, I make mistakes. I, I, I make I, I make mistakes every now and again, right? But I'm prepared to listen to myself and whoever's telling me. But um, I, I can tell that that's wrong for a start. The all the jars are the wrong way up. It's too tightly compact together, and they all stick together, and they all bond in the kiln. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the same as if you um. If you get two green pots and you force them up against each other, um, they might not completely bond with each other, um, but in some kilns, the temperatures are so hot, they might all melt together and be one kind of composite oomph, okay? And that's very much the problem. So what we're going to do now, we're going to take a little break. Is there any questions? I'll go and give it to us. Because yeah. he wanted to burn them because they would be wrong with some tension thing. Yeah. And he kept putting them on like this and putting the fire up because it was like this. Yes. So what he had to do, he had to screw them all up. Yeah. Like, yes. Like yes. He had to screw them all up. So he was there and I was screwing them up so that the fire yes. wouldn't go out. So That's it. Thing, like a, right. a blade. Yeah. A brazier, yes. That's what you've got to do. Yeah. That's what you've got to do. That's exactly what you do. My, my we, yeah, we, we we've moved to um, well, Michelle's bought a house, and we're 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 living there every more or less most of the time. And uh, my Owen was in the in the shed the other day. He came out with all these newspapers and stuff, and I thought, right. Uh, because I, I, I don't believe in recycling. I, I, I just believe that you, you should burn it all. But anyway, um, anyway, because in the authority we live in, they burn everything anyway, so it don't matter. They, uh, and in Barry as well, they, they built a new incinerator, so recycling goes out the window. It's all going to be incinerated. So um, you've got a different authority here that yeah. still recycles. Um, so that, that the point I'm trying to make is that is is that you know that's not that's not a um, that's not an option for us. So um, Owen, Owen just said we got we got this um, stove in the house, right? An old-fashioned stove. And Owen put a load of newspapers in there. I said, "What are you doing?" And he said, "Oh, I'm burning them." I said, they, "They just won't burn. They just won't burn. You've got to screw them up. You've got to you've got to put them this way and go and do them that. There's an art to burning, right? And it's the same with the potteries. There is an art to burning, um, right? So what 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 I want to do um, is we're gonna we're gonna take a we're gonna take a break from that for now. Okay. He was in clay pits, reckon he still got a bit Billy of clay. was in clay pits. He'd reckon he still got a bit of clay to help him out when they take it out. Oh right. What what he's 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 still got a bit there? He's what? Ah oh, right. There must have been quite a lot of uh, clay on here, so we've got to be honest with you. So so yeah, but basically with this you've got um, 
These, these are relatively all inverted, and the ones that are not inverted are broken and cracked, so that's the point. Uh, this is a kiln that they reconstructed actually in Colchester, because they've got quite a number of kilns in Colchester, which I'm going to read out. Um, so if we, if we go from there, that's them taking the pots out. You can see that they're all, in, well, mainly inverted. Um, and this relates to an earlier image. Um, and if you, we'll go back to the earlier image in a, in a few moments. This is a, um, known as a prothurnium. A prothurnium is actually, these are all prothurnium. This is actually the uh, Roman name for a kiln. And this is a dual prothurnium. But a dual prothurnium would need great skill to operate. And why would it need great skill to operate? Because this is all a unified kiln. This is all one area, okay? So if one person's putting one log in that end, you've got to put one log in the other end. So if they're putting some charcoal in this end, you've got to put some charcoal in this end. It's all about keeping the temperature the same. And this is, this is about great skill. And something, to, um, something that was a hallmark of Roman civilization was actually Roman Samian ware. Uh, this is actually a Roman Samian ware kiln uh, in France. And this Roman Samian ware kiln, um, it's extremely well built. Uh, Roman Samian ware itself is that wonderful uh, glossy pottery uh, that was uh, traded all the way across the Roman world and was very much sought after in this country. But what happened, like most things that are very popular, um, forgeries are produced. Um, and forgeries were produced in Colchester um, and in places like um, London as well. So before we, before we discuss more about um, what's going on in Colchester, for example, let's look at this. So if I can turn out the lights, see if I can turn out the lights, so I can do everything in this room. Uh, Thank you. Um, this, is actually, this is actually found, um, Roman excavations in Dagenham in London. Um, and when I originally looked at this, I actually, I actually felt, oh, there's something very um, interesting with this. My first translation was that this area around here, uh, there had been some other packing material uh, that's since been removed, but I was completely wrong. I should have thought as an archaeologist. Um, when we're excavating things like this, okay, what we do and we go down on the same distance around the boundary of something to reveal what we're looking at. And then I revealed I was right, because that's the blue. Uh, the level of the ground itself would be down on this end. Uh, but back in the Roman period, what the Romans had done is simply scooped out the clay out the ground uh, in the shape of a key. You can see that's in the shape of a key. Um, and then they lined it with clay uh, and that basically was the kiln itself. And that there would have been the plinth. This would have all been solid clay around the outside. That's an illusion that the archaeologists of Elias believe. That would be solid clay all the way around the outside. And there would have been little spokes on here going out. Um, and then they would have stacked the pottery on the plate on top with those little holes in. Um, and then the pottery itself would be inverted. Uh, and then they would create uh, a, an artificial mound around that, like, like a little dome, which, as you know from that earlier image, they would have they would have broken into and they would have taken the pottery out. Interrupt. Yeah, well, that's the picture. How are they creating the top dome? How do you see yourself with debris and the excess clay going on top of it? They did. You just said it. The architect said it was you would have a layer of clay around the outside. Well, I don't think so. No, that that's that's what I no, that's what I thought when I looked at it. But then I realised I was wrong. Basically, what what's basically happening um, is that I eventually realised that all it simply was they took a scoop out of the ground and with this protrusion out here, which is the stoke hole, and they lined it with clay, and that was basically the kiln. There, there was no anything else in here. Oh, the problem is, me. the problem is with archaeo The problem is with when, the problem is when you're um, 
looking at an archaeological set of excavations and a member of the public, right? Um, you, 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 see, you see weird features and you think, oh, that, that's what it could have been like in the past, but it wasn't. It's the way we do these things so that we can understand what's going on. So the archaeologists are taking the scoop all the way around the outside to reveal the thickness of the kiln, and that's basically what's going on. Um, this, this, is, this, is, this is one of those, this, this kiln itself. It's all sealed. This, this, is, this is basically one of those. This is basically one of those. So basically... Okay, you mean that a small hole in the top, in the dome? Um, yes, they would have. Mm. But ba oh, okay. Basically, all that's surviving, all that's surviving um, is this area here. Yeah, of course. That, 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 that's, that's all that bottom stuff is surviving. That's all that's surviving. When, because when the archaeological trust get excavated, they only found the, the plate on top of it. The dome itself has been removed to get access, as we've already said, to the pottery as this is happening here. So what I what I wanted us to do is actually look at. Um, I got some written text, um, but this is actually um, a clay, a clay, um, a clay a pottery lamp. And this is a mould, this is a mould for a clay pottery lab. Um, and what you can see, somebody has taken the time to carve into solid limestone this design. And, and this, this is basically um, the mould to create the cast. And the cast itself is what's fired in the kiln. Obviously, they'd have to put a, a top on there and everything. But that's basically um, the mould for it. So... What I'm going to do, I'm going to read some. I'm going to read some text out now, um, if we want to go to it. And Dorothy, you're very quiet today. Have you got a lot on your mind? I know. Did you ever have time to listen to anything I've got to say? Really? Okay. I don't know why then. Oh, this is the one. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly uh, glance over this. Now this this is describing uh, pottery kilns that have been found in the Colchester area. We don't need to go through all of it, uh, but in places like Colchester, uh, they they found a large number of kilns, and Colchester was one of those areas in Britain um, that was a manufacturing centre for pottery. Now, one of, one, of my, um, one of my lads in Cumbria, he's called Tom. Um, he's in his early 20s. He's been coming along to my class since he was about 18. Um, and um, he, he goes to um, a Roman site called uh, Watercrick Fort. Um, and when he went to Watercrick Fort, he found this piece of pottery one day that looked like Roman Samian. And didn't you find a piece of pottery that looked like Roman Samian? I said it was artificial. It was a yeah. fake. It's from the site of the year of yeah, that's right. So, so that's two of you. So Tom had this piece of pottery and I identified it as um, fake Roman Samian, which would probably come from Colchester. Um, Colchester was a hub of manufacturing um, Roman pottery. And it's probably places like Colchester that led to the factories producing Roman Samian ware in France to actually be closed down because we were making fakes. It's just basically... Um, if everybody had made, made Adidas fake shoes, Adidas would go, go out of business and would all we'd have is the fake Adidas shoes because it's a brand and that's exactly what happened with Roman Samian wear. It's probably so, it was so dramatic with the Roman Samian wear factories that there's talk that the factories were deliberately set alight because they couldn't, they, there's no point you making Samian anymore because they couldn't make much of a profit. But anyway, back, back to um, Colchester, uh, they've been excavating a large number of kilns a lot of the kilns are left with is, is keyhole sort of shaped structures in the ground. So there's a key. Okay, so you can imagine all they're finding in the ground, um, uh, basically. So all the top bits being taken off, all the hoods being taken off, um, and you've got the outline as you can see here uh, with this little protrusion, um, as we saw with, for example, that's what they're finding. So the rest of it's gone. 
So they've been finding many, many, many examples of these in Colchester. Now, Colchester is one of those amazing archaeological landscapes in the Roman period. But not only have you got um, the temple of um, Emperor Claudius, you've got some of the Roman walls and a um, they're, they're, little bit of a gateway there, and you've got Roman remains and um, the outline of an amphitheatre and all the rest of it. You've got actually some of the industry as well, which is quite spectacular. Um, nearly 40 Roman pottery kilns have been found in Colchester alone. But you can imagine, in Roman Britain, there's been hundreds and hundreds of pottery kilns found. But very, very few pottery kilns from the um, Neolithic or Iron Age have ever been found in Britain. But we'll resolve that with a little bit of information from Orkney before we finish. So the kilns themselves um, have been recorded around the city um, in varying places. Um, and we even know the names of some of the, the potters or workshops because they would stamp their names into the pots as well. Um, very, 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 very rare finds of uh, potter's names in pottery. But the ones in Colchester have, have got names like um, Ecceptus and Cunapectus and Gabrus and Letera and Lucagenus and Janilis. And those are from names that we can see stamped on the pots. And, um, and we, we've got the name of a potter um, that was found on a, um, a tile stamped into it from the Roman official building at Glanamore. And his name was um, Doodles. 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 It was called Doodles. Doodles the potter. Um, so it's good that we've actually got some of the names because in, in Roman Britain uh, we've been slowly working out we've, we've known for years some of the names of people in Roman Britain because of on gravestones now we've found their names on the Vindolanda tablets and tablets have been found in London for all places and in pottery we, we get the, the potter's names as well so it's good that we've got, got the potter's names as well um, and pottery itself um, when we think about Roman Britain um, Roman life included the manufacture, trading, using and reusing of a lot of pottery. None of it went to waste. So say, for example, you'd have a big pottery kiln um, and you had loads of wasters. Um, basically, as I remember saying at the beginning, a, a waster is, is a pot that's either been overfired, has melted and fused, has gone wrong, or basically as you took the pot out of the kiln, it just broke. So th those bits of pottery might be used um, in the construction of walls, where they'd be placed in as hardcore. Um, they, they might be used in some of the uh, flooring, where it would all be broken up. Um, they might actually be reused and ground down and placed into uh, new pottery, okay, as some kind of aggregate. And some of the pot itself would be used in the building of the kilns themselves, because they'd already been fired. So we've got all this pottery being reused. So nothing Nothing in a pottery sense in the Roman world ever went to waste. You might, you might have a, a potter uh, making um, pots. At the same time, he's making um, pots for the Roman military. He might be making lamps. He might be making creational urns. All this goes into the, the, the um, furnace. And he, roof tiles might go into the furnace. Basically, these kilns um, are made to order kilns. Uh, I can remember describing in Lantwick Major, just as an example, say for example it's the medieval period, but this is the Roman period we're talking about. You've got a potter, he's got a bit of a cash flow problem. So, um, so a local villa owner goes to him, he says, right, I want, I, I want 20 of these pots. And a local builder goes to him, he says, oh right, I want 100 roof tiles. And somebody else goes, I tell you what, I can sell 50 of your pots in, in the local market. And he says, right, right guys, right, so we've got all these itinerant potters working for him, there's, there's five guys, we want to get all these pots in there as quick as possible, right, but he makes that one classic mistake, he doesn't put spaces in between them all, we know what happens if we don't put spaces in them, they all fuse together, and as he opens a kiln, everything is ruined, and that could mean the difference um, between paying his workforce and people being able to eat that week, and not being able to pay his workforce. And that, that's, how, that's how important the potter's work is. He falls asleep for one moment, for an hour, then, he, then all the pots are ruined. Uh, you know, I, I, I know people who bake and cook 
And, and you know, it's, it's a typical thing. The, somebody who's trying to make custard, you've got to continually stir it. If you don't stir it for a second, the custard's ruined. And that's exactly the same with the potter. And people would have experienced that in the medieval period. If you're unable to produce your pots for somebody, you're not going to get a bowl of grain that week to feed your workforce because it's hand-to-mouth economy in the medieval period in particular. In the Roman period, there's going to be money available, but not vast amounts of it. And what you get paid is very important. And, and in fact, the average week of a potter may be as follows. So you've got a Roman road, and alongside the Roman road, um, somebody wants to put up a Roman mansio. You know, basically for people to stay, it was a bit like a motel, like uh, like uh, crossroads. Um, basically, he says, right, Potter, uh, I do believe there's some clay besides the road. Okay, so yes, the Potter sets up his pottery, um, and the developer says, right, I can't use this road to get tiles from the local town because by the time they get here, half of them are going to be broken. So I need to make them here. So the potter sets up and he creates all these roof tiles. And then a group of people come along the road and they basically say, right, um, we want some jugs. Can you, make them, can you make them by the end of the week? Um, all this is really intensive uh, because not only has he got a group of people working for him, from day one to day seven in the week, you've got a day one, they're making the pots, they're collecting the brushwood, they're making sure that the kiln's ready. They stack the kiln on the second day, third kiln, third day, and they're setting light to the kiln, fourth day, third and fourth day, they're watching it, fifth day, everything's cooling down, sixth day, you distribute everything, and you're back to the seventh day where you're having to continue working, that's how intense it was. And in fact, all the industries that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks, milling, milling's exactly the same, because you've got to keep the mill wheel going. And if you don't keep the mill wheel going at the same rate, one of those little spokes that breaks off, nobody's going to be able to have their grain milled that week. And that could mean the difference between an economy collapsing in the village or not. It's the same with limestone. We're going to look at the lime industry as well. Let's see if I can find another file. So we are slowly coming to the end. Um, now this, this, is, this is a very interesting one. Okay, now um, archaeologists, when they're trying to find an archaeological site, um, we, used to, we used to have this mindset, to find an archaeological site, you need to actually find the kiln to say they were making pottery there. And most of the time, archaeologists would never ever find the kiln. So they'd say, right, they, the, the pottery must have been produced somewhere else and just go off frustrated. But... If they were looking for the proper clues that archaeologists look for, if they find, right, there's a clay pit there, and we've got pottery that looks relatively similar in colour to the clay, right, that might be an indication that the pottery is actually made practically alongside where the clay pit is. But then if you find pottery that's been mutated and broken up um, and congealed in all shapes and forms, you know that the pottery must be basically there. Even though you might not find the kiln, all those wasters haven't been taken too far. They've just been tossed over there. Because when I was, um, a few years ago, I had um, a, a girl called Tracy come to me. Um, Tracy Usherwood. And her mum owned the garden centre at UNE. And mum and dad owned the garden centre. And she came to me with this nice little box with all these um, twisted and broken bits of black pottery. Okay? Which is a manganese oxide. Um, which had darkened the colour to make it look black, manganese black. Um, and she showed me all these wasters and she said, wow, look at these. And I said, right, that's because in your garden, uh, at Bridge Farm Nursery, that's it, you must have had another pottery. So we, we looked in the books and lo and behold, in 1945, I think it was 1945, an archaeologist from the museum excavated a pottery kiln on her land. So the two things come together. You've got a pottery kiln at Bridge Farm, Bridge Farm Nursery. Uh, so by looking, finding those wasters meant you had a pottery kiln. 
Um, but she did. Uh, we, we did know a pottery kiln was there because it was excavated in 1945. So li little entries like this. Since 1945, this is in Norfolk. Objects have been uh, recovered from the area. Iron Age, Roman material. Excavation took place in 1950, uncovering a number of rubbish pits filled with pottery, sherds, and oyster shells. That that could um, that could indicate um, that that actually might be you know something to do with settlement. But here's a clue for there being a kiln there. 1952, um, fire bar, bars, a, a brigatage had been recovered, all indicating pottery industry, and this recorded the presence of a pottery kiln, even though they hadn't found the kiln itself, um, and that's very important. Lots of things in archaeology are looking for evidence, but not actually finding the building. Um, so say, for example, um, you find loads of bits of pottery in the field and loads of shells and brooches and stuff, you might not be able to find the settlement or the building that they came from, but we know that there was a settlement there somewhere. And that's about proper archaeology. Archaeology is not always about finding a building. It's about finding the debris from a building, for example. Um, and I've got a nice little find that I want to share with you. Um, a medieval find. Oh. What's that? Okay. All oh, right, no, you know, none of you, none of you have won the national lottery this this week, unfortunately. No, no, I, I hadn't won the national lottery. You know, I, I hadn't won it. I hadn't won it. Uh, this, this is a little article. This is, um, and it's basically, it's basically saying this: pottery kilns of Roman date are well known throughout southern England. Kilns were basic and easily constructed for the purpose of manufacturing coarse kitchenware pottery. And lots of things. In general, Roman pottery kilns were little more than ovens, usually partially below ground level, so you get the updraft. Um, and depending on the type of pottery required, had different types of flues and supports for the pottery undergoing firing. Um, and lots of sites. This is uh, one one at Ash, um, which is near Dartford. It says the the kiln firing chamber at Ash was roughly circular with a kiln floor sunk below the ground surface. Just below ground level, the kiln uh, was partly lined with broken tile. So tile being reused, everything's reused. Um, it is possible that the tile served as a ledge or platform to support the pottery that was being fired. Evidence suggests that this kiln was used to manufacture greyware imitation of a popular um, North Kent coarse ware pottery from about the 100s. And that would indicate that the flow of oxygen was restricted to give it uh, that wonderful grey wear colour. So that, that's it from the Romans today. Um, and what I'd like to quickly do is share you two things. Um, two things we've missed out either end. Um, in, in, on Orkney, right, uh, where Bill's been near this pottery at Harry on the mainland. Yes, we did, Bill. Was, was that what you were saying? Yes, we did. And guess who? Guess who has uh, managed to pass her um, access course? Mm. Michelle. Really? Yeah, she she um she she passed her access course. I was I was actually very um I was very frustrated because my um uh my, my master's degree marks were just basically passing marks, and it was just like she um her first assignment she had a sixty eight percent, and I said you've actually got to be there. And then she she um, she got a B for her assignment, so she got through access course, so she could do a Bachelor of Arts at um, University of Highlands Islands. Islands, basically the access course to get into university, the test to see if you're worthy or not. So she passed it, and she was looking at these sites up there as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, Using the limited evidence from these sites, basically what they found on the ground, uh, they, they found an area which was about um, one and a half metres, they from there to there, of, of uh, the ground around the outside would have been brown, and in the middle, it was already dark brown and black, okay, and, and they worked out um, from the pottery around that this had been in the Neolithic period, and they thought, this must have been a fire. Uh, a normal fire um, for a house.
house and people said, actually, there's no buildings around. There's, there's actually no buildings here. And then somebody said, oh, actually, um, they, they, they must have just been heating up rocks or something. And, and the archaeologist said, no, they, they weren't. Um, that, that indicates the temperature was of a certain um, level that we see when people fire in pottery. Um, and th those are the first signs in Orkney um, from the Neolithic period, excavated in 2006, that we've got um, pottery kilns. Okay, mm -hmm. and the way that they tested this out, so you, you've, got a, you've got a little um, stoke hole leading into them, okay, and it's dug off the ground, um, and it goes gently into a conical shape. As you can see, it gently overlaps, gently overlaps, and then you'd, then you'd put your pottery in there, um, and it would just base, they, 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 there must be, there must be the level that you would, um, you'd have a, a material, kindling material, then you would pile in the pottery on top, um, and they actually demonstrated this, and they proved that you can actually get pottery out of a very kiln, a crude kiln like that. It wouldn't fire a high temperature, maybe about 400, 500 de degrees C, but it, it would give some structural stability to the pottery itself. And I'm just going to plug this in. What the space was made of? The spaces would have been made of wet clay or something wet. So, so what, what, what would happen as the pot as the pot dries out, right, in the kiln and it heats up? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the spacer itself would still be wet. So when that dries out, everything dries at a different temperature, and that would dry out, and then basically um, the, the wasters would be then surfaced to requirement. That's basically it. That wouldn't fuse, would it? Not? No, it wouldn't fuse because at different temperatures. As as they dry at different temperatures, right. with, with a pot, for example, if you're if you're going to um, if if you're going to put a handle on a pot, mm. yeah, um, this has to be the same um, dampness as this. If this is drier than this, then no matter what you do, it's not going to stick. Yeah. And you've got you've got to have um, a bit of um, a like slip between the two of them, a mixture of clay and water. So you 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 then stick these together, um, and and they would fuse. So it wouldn't create knobs or anything. No, no, no. Um, and then finally, what what we've got here, um, we've got. We've got a find that was made in, in Wales just a couple of years ago. Can you remember in, in, in West Wales, I mentioned that they'd found um, some pottery kilns in Newport in West Wales? Well, anyway, uh, they, they, that's what they found in West Wales. There you go. Newport hidden medieval kiln. Even though it was found in 1921, they completely forgot about it. And it was rediscovered very recently. So Newport's hidden medieval kiln... While preparing the foundations in January 1921, builders found two pottery kilns from the 1400s, which are now understood to be the only Welsh uh, pottery kilns to be discovered, which isn't actually right. We do actually have examples of pottery kilns um, from the medieval period found in Wales. Uh, this kiln is still largely intact under the stage area of the hall. And uh, basically what they're going to do, um, the, basically the work to the kiln uh, will bring multiple benefits to the area. Uh, tourist trade, um, uh, basically safeguarding the future of the, the kiln um, the kiln and the hall because people are going to visit it and they're going to have loads of events. So the, the value of pottery kilns is very important. We may, we may have the pottery itself, um, but the kilns themselves are very difficult to find. But when we do find them, they're, they're very, very special because it's at that moment that people in the past um, would have had their pottery fired to keep liquids in, to keep grain in, to put on a mantelpiece as keepsakes. Pottery is a sign of civilization and people staying in one spot. And one thing I want to finish with as well, um, and this is a lesson that I learned. In, in 1997, um, um, Helen and I, um, on September the 16th, um, we're, we're going to get married, which was Welsh Independence Day. And it was a weekday. Uh, but a few months earlier, we decided to go to Warwick Castle. 
um, on exactly the day after um, Lady Diana died. Um, and it was a very strange event, this Warwick Castle, because we went there to pick up some uh, re re reproduction medieval jugs, right? And we said we want reproduction medieval jugs. And there's reproduction medieval jugs, and there's reproduction medieval jugs. We wanted reproduction medieval jugs, not the reproduction medieval jugs that we had. And what the hell am I on about? Well, some jugs were never meant to store liquid in. They were meant to be table pieces, or they were meant to, you, you'd keep dry stuff in there. So we had these three beautifully produced jugs, right? And we brought them back with us. And I can remember, um, on the day of the wedding, we had somebody pour mead into these three medieval jugs. And then after an hour, the outside of the jugs become very, very damp because the mead had made its way all the way through the, the, these reproduction medieval jugs. They, they, they basically hadn't been proofed. They, they should have been glazed in the inside, fully on the inside. And if they're not fully glazed on the inside, then liquid goes straight through it. Um, that's a lesson I learned. You've got to ask, can liquid be stored in them? And we didn't. Um, in the medieval period, finally, what we do find on archaeological sites, we find jugs, for example. And on the jug, it's completely lined on the inside with a glaze. Except, on the outside, there's no glaze at all. Except for one area, this area known as the fin. And as you're drinking, the liquid, um, which would be excess as, you know, as it dribbles out, would actually go down the fin. And it wouldn't be absorbed into the earthenware on the side. That was a theory. Glaze itself would have been very, very expensive, particularly in the medieval period. So you, you, know, you, you can imagine this, you've got a very poor potter, and most of the people who this potter is selling to don't have two pennies to rub together. And that, that's true. They didn't have one penny to rub together about against anything else. Um, and you had a choice. If, if, you're, um, if you're mixing a wash together to create a glaze, and what is a glaze? We've all had hot chocolate, haven't we? And in hot chocolate, when we pour in the, um, the spoon of hot chocolate or spoons of hot chocolate, it's like a little bit of a fine dust, isn't it? And as you put it into the hot water, it all melts and whatever, but, the, but it really turns cloudy. And as you add more hot chocolate, the thicker and thicker it gets. That's the same as glaze, because um, glaze itself um, is a mixture. Say, for example, you wanted a honey colour to your jars, you would have to add... Um, iron oxide, really finely ground up. And then you'd have to add lead oxide, very finely ground up. You'd chuck a bit of clay in there, watered down clay, you'd put water in there, you'd all shake it together so it's really, really sort of um, liquidy, but it's still thick enough. And then what you would do, you'd dunk your whole pot in it, right? You take your pot out, you let it stand on um, th um, three spaces, and then when that's dried, you'd invert it, you'd put it in your kiln. Now that's if you wanted a table piece to show off, because you could not stir liquid in it. Then, if you wanted to store liquid in it, you'd just basically pour your glaze in it. Remember, this is still a wet pot, so you can't exactly shake it. You'd pour your wet glaze in there, okay? Um, the potter would have to be skilled enough to be able to make sure that that wash, that glaze, is in all the little cracks. Then as he's placing it in an inverted way in the kiln, you'd have to pour all that liquid out so the whole thing doesn't completely collapse. Put it inverted in the kiln, and that's your glazed on the inside, okay? Because glaze was very expensive, you had to make a choice. And it's, it's as easy as this in closing. If, you, if, you've got, if you've got 100 jars, right, and you've only got enough glaze to cover the inside and outside of 50 jars, right, you use the glaze wash to cover the inside of all 100 jars, but none of them would be covered outside because the glaze and the, the materials inside the glaze were very, very expensive. And on archaeological sites, you know you've got a piece of medieval pottery, because there's glaze on one side and there's no glaze on the outside. And that's how you've got medieval pottery. 
Later pottery had glaze on the inside and the outside because they could afford it. Roman pottery, strangely enough, didn't need glazes because they fired their potteries at completely different temperatures and they had different materials inside them. But this was never a pottery lecture. This was a lecture about kilns and firing. Are there any questions today? Mm. Last other one was salmonware. What would need glaze? That was salmonware was the top quality. It was burnished. Ever. Yeah. Because of the colour and quality of the clay. The yes, wine? it was the quality of the clay. It was Not really fine ground ball. clay. Yeah. Ball. Yeah. Not even a harvest of salmon. Um, no, it, it was South, South East Gaul. Um, I don't actually know how they got the name Samian. That's your homework, Bill, for next week. Your homework for next week, Bill. It's got to be. It's got to be. But I want you to look that up. Any questions, people? Have you all enjoyed? Yes, thank you. Right, we have a potter's wheel in next week and then pack the demonstration. Oh, no, we can't have a potter's wheel in next week because we're not doing pottery next week. We are actually doing mills. No. We're doing the milling process next week. Oh, We're doing mill buildings. Yeah, yeah, just bring a big stone in. Right, thank you very much, folks. I'll see you all next week. Thank you. <coughs> it's a pleasure, as ever, Dorothy. I know you did, but you broke half of them on the way home, so I wouldn't bother. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Anyway, thank you, folks. Uh, yes, for next week. Oh, no, can you look after him, Bill? Or, or Dorothy, if you want to look after him. Yeah, basically, there's one for Jim, one for Rob, and one for Anne. So George has had his, and that's it. Thank you very much, folks. I'll see you all next week. Thank you.